Hey, uh, welcome to What the Truck. I'm Dooner. I'm here with the dude, man, Michael Vincent. How's it going? Hey, sit still for a second. Uh, what? What's the matter? I got something here. <laughs> I'm taking something here. Hold my beer. I got to do What? <laughs> Sorry, what you was that you about? You on your head. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> I, think was, I think it was the one from the debate. He followed you over Hold here. Hold on for a second. Oh, let, me, let me try again. <laughs> one more time. One more time. Give him some cowbell, hey. Dooner. Use my head. Hey, everybody. This is What the Truck. This is our twice a week, on normal days, when we're not at events. This is our twice a week podcast. It's a, the biggest variety show in freight. I'm Dooner. That's the dude, Michael Vincent. You can find this show on your favorite podcast player by looking up What the Truck or look up Freightcast, where every single Freightways podcast is, or download the Freightways TV app if you want to watch the madness happen. The magic. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us at Last Mile Logistics. This has been an amazing event over lunch where we're eating lasagna. Michael Vincent That's and I right. were talking about how this has been one of our favorite virtual events so far because it's a space that just on a personal level, we don't get to focus on as much. And it's really cool. It's getting really narrow, deep, and dirty with all of you. Yeah, it really is. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to Final Mile inbound and outbound or, or forward and reverse logistics, et cetera. There's so much tech involved. There's so much more involved with customer engagement, et cetera. It's, it's really interesting and it's really great. And we've got some great industry leaders that have some great quotes so far. We have some amazing guests coming up on the show, but before we even got to them, as you said, we had some awesome quotes. One of them came right at the beginning of the show. It was from Eric, Eric Caldwell, and he said that supply chain is about invisibility. If you do everything perfectly, you're invisible. It's one of those jobs where uh, the better you do it, the less love you get. Yeah, that's exactly right. The phone doesn't ring, you're doing it well. No, no, you know what? You know, we say that. We say that because people don't com complain at the point of action, right? But they do tell people. They, there is word of mouth. Amazon Prime is good. It works really well. There's word of mouth. Like, I've during the COVID pandemic, I've ordered from a lot of different shippers. And I've been telling everybody, I'm like, man, if you see something like direct from the direct from the seller, you don't necessarily have to go to Amazon anymore. A lot of these companies are offering free shipping, two-day delivery. I got some boots from Doc Martens, man, and Gene Simmons boots. Oh, yeah? Two days. Free shipping. Sweet. Free shipping. Don't have to worry about any like counterfeit or anything like that. It's super cool. So all the supply chains are starting to pick up. Last mile delivery, big part of it. In fact, so much of that shipping is happening, not just through Amazon, who's had their own challenges, but as he said, 25 to 30 percent additional capacity, additional capacity over summer peak this holiday season. Yeah, it's amazing, right? Uh, that that they're going to need that much capacity, and and they're just expect. I mean, and uh, what we on great quarter guys they were talking about. Uh, Seth was expecting it to be uh, what flat to above last year's yeah. holiday peak. Can we talk about Which great quarter was guys. Big. Uh, we have not. Can we talk? No, can we talk about them? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. I think we can. I think we have the ability. Now, Seth didn't bring up the $90,000 jet ski he was going to get from Nikola, but they were talking oh. about the Faida effect, and that got me hungry. And then I was thinking <laughs> even more, what the heck is the Faida effect? Well, it turns out the Faida effect is like when someone's coming out with the, you know, with the Faida plate. Everyone in the restaurant sees it. They start ordering They smell faidas. it. They hear the sizzle. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a Legos that you can eat, kind of. You have to assemble okay. it yourself. I see that. All right. That, Faida that, effect. <laughs> What else did they say on there? Oh, it was Bruce Chen, right, from, from Stifle. He was like, he doesn't think, you know, he, he popped your balloon. He said he doesn't think we'll see Amazon's blimp releasing a swarm of drones for final mile delivery. Yeah, I was really disappointed when he said I was really hoping for him to say, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, those are coming up next week. I mean, how cool would that be? Uh, it would be cool, but, like, it would be so tempting just to, you know, get out my skeet shooter start just like taking shots off them. But the thing is, like, if you do that when you're like, a teenager, you know, when you're throwing like rocks at a delivery drone, yeah. it's kind of yeah. cool to your friends. But if yeah. you're in the newspaper with your mug shot, 41 years old for shooting down drones, people think you're a madman. Yeah, you're going to jail, you're a crazy man. Yeah, yeah 16, <laughs> when you're 16, you're just a wild kid having just fun. You know how cool is Dooner, he was shooting down yeah. drones. He's hey, like come on over my house, He's like man. a little kid out there. <laughs> You know, John Madden people. You know, John Madden. Yeah. <laughs> that was crazy. What else did we learn from some of these uh, sessions? Yeah, so uh, let's see here. I mean, they're talking about, you know, on Great Quarter Guys, again, they were talking about Uber, you know, and, and bringing in the Uber Eats and trying to build that really uh, the world's most dense final mile network, right? And would this be a, a disruptor or not? And really the sentiment was like it's, it's, it's aspirational for sure, and it is uh, something that will be very, very good, but not, not really disruptive. Yeah. 
Well, they're talking about, in the comments right now, they're talking about curbside, and one said, curbside is basically ding dong ditch. Talk about childhood games, things you do when you're 16. Not shooting down drones, but playing ding dong ditch. He says, uh, the threshold inside the door room of choice is exactly that, and white glove includes a brief uh, assembly and removal of dunnage or trash. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning with the Peloton, which you can win at this event, live.freightwaves.com. XBO delivers that to you, but there's pandemic rules in effect for the white glove service, which means they'll put some of it together for you, but they still Still will leave it in the threshold. So White Glove has adapted, but the scope of what White Glove can do has been limited by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, it certainly has made it a little bit more difficult. And and uh, so, but you know, the ding ding dong ding, ding dong ditch is a good. Is a, that was a good comment. I yeah. kind of like that. But yeah, the final mile in that that over the glove. And uh, so you know, they spoke about that. I think it was uh, Karen Tyndall that was talking about that, where they're seeing that it's really just first threshold, right? First dry is what you call it. So inside a carport, inside a garage, that type of stuff, and not inside the house, the actual living uh, quarters and, and setup is, is kind of is gone, right? Which then affects your packaging and all that other kind of stuff. So very difficult too, space to be inside. There's a big topic too about USPS and how USPS's role is evolving to uh, in a lot of ways, some of the arguments were they were being subsidized by a lot of shippers. You know, they were being used by, for like Amazon, for example. That had been a criticism. Amazon was using them in areas where they're not leveraged properly. They don't have the density. So whenever that's the case, throw it over to USPS Network. But then comes the real ramifications of the business use case versus the public use case of something like USPS. And they seem kind of like they're stuck in that hybrid model and they need to break out to either become profitable or be categorized as a service where it's just looked at differently. Yeah, there's different opinions as to whether their association with Amazon and other parcel delivery uh, is is profitable or not. And I think one of the comments during that segment was that, uh, you know, the U, U, uh, USPS is, is a pinata to be uh, poked and beaten by Bezos at, at whim. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, but actually looking into the, the paperwork and the data that has been released fairly recently, I suppose, uh, they actually make a couple $1.8 billion off of Amazon. Uh, so it's not as non-profitable as you would think it would be, I guess, according to some analysts, I suppose. Well, I, I think the thing is, a lot of times when people, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of times when people categorize the USPS when they're complaining about it, they're like, the only reason they're alive is because they send junk mail and things like that, which is not really entirely true. And then it's become a hot button political issue, obviously, because of mail-in ballots and all of those kind of things. And, you know, our guest, he, he had a lot of candor as well. He had definitely had an opinion and a slant He had some on... opinions. He had a, he had, we can tell which way he's leaning on the political spectrum, I think. And you can <laughs> and, and see, the thing is, too, like, I, I think one of the comments in there was from, like, 45 makes us great or something. So if you're on the other side of the political spectrum, those comments are really going to stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they, they, they definitely are. But I'll tell you what, I learned, uh, I, I, I had a today years old, I learned this during that, and that was that the Hope Diamond, yeah. $345 million worth of diamond, was actually shipped USPS. Really? Yeah. Wow. No, and no. I heard him say that, and I looked it up, and sure enough, it was. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't know if you mentioned it. I'm curious about the number of cyber attacks that the USPS faces. Though I remember when we were when we were talking at our, our our global trade tech summit, the port of LA, Gene Soroka, he was like, "We get 59 million cyber attacks." Right. What was it right. a day? It was some ridiculous. It number was a like crazy that. number. Yeah, it was. I forget what the time period was, but we were both in in shock. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, what, are you going to hold my junk mail ransom? Yeah. Uh, I, well. dare you. I dare you. I <laughs> dare you. I think there's like critical <laughs> medications and stuff coming through oh, the mail, yeah, too. Oh, yeah, well, there's that stuff. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes, there is. <laughs> hey, we're going to have a bunch of guests coming up after the break. We've got uh, Nicole Glenn from Candor Expedite. Yeah, excellent, right? She's That's super excited, yeah. She's going to talk about uh, what differences come from working with more standard and more niche providers, some of the pratfalls to avoid, how to leverage the power of that network, and all of those kind of all of those kind of things. And as you can see from a lot of the conversations we're having and the conversations you're seeing in the comments section, a lot of companies are already starting to shift and pivot and become more of hybrids. LTL providers starting to add white glove service. All of these kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. And then Kelly Picard, CEO at, uh, what is it, Hackbarth Delivery Services. Yes. Yeah. We'll be on talking about regional final mile carriers, how they can benefit the shoppers, disaster preparedness. Um, she went to LSU, home of Shaq. She, home, of, <laughs> home of Shaq, home of, home of Shaq, absolutely. What about uh, Tiffany so, Novich from uh, Full Tilt Logistics? Yeah, I want to talk to her about rugby. Yes, yeah, she's a former, <laughs> former rugby player. That's got me excited. And we're also going to see one of the coolest uh, self-driving vehicles that we have ever seen, autonomous vehicle. We're going to come into a break, but we'll be back on What the Truck. So stick around and keep chatting on live.freightwaves.com. Yeah, man. Let's ring the uh, dinner bell. 
Corral on some guests. Let's bring him over here up into the stage Let's and get him over in the bullpen. And I'm excited to talk to our first one. It's Tiffany Novich. She's CEO at Full Tilt Logistics. And look at this for background. She graduated from the University of Nevada, right, in Reno, where she enjoyed playing competitive rugby. Wow. Yeah, that, that, I, yeah, we have to talk to her about that. Tiffany, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about that rugby experience. Has that, has that helped you later on in life? Yeah, so I'm Tiffany Novich. Um, I live in Reno, Nevada, and I high school rodeoed, and then I attended the University of Nevada, Reno, and I found out that there was a sport where you could tackle other girls, and I thought, hey, this sounds fun. So I played for five years. Um, I was the captain for three, and then a girlfriend in, um, of mine and I traveled around the United States playing for a professional USA women's rugby team. So uh, a lot of beer drinking, a lot of tackling, and, um, you know, a lot of leadership. So I think it really kind of helps me uh, be a better CEO, I guess. Yeah, beer drinking and tackling. I mean, those are the two uh, highest skills right? for a CEO, right? <laughs> well, let, me ask you, let, me, let me ask you something. Do you know how to do the haka? I've watched a little New Zealand rugby, and the haka is a, is a, is a big deal in that. It's a lot of... Yeah, right, so right. We, had something, we had something similar at the university, but ours had a lot to do with, um, you know, Reno and, and UNR, but it was our own version of the haka. I don't exactly remember all the words or if they're that appropriate for this time. Well, this is what the truck, anything's appropriate. <laughs> but another, another cool thing about your leadership, and one of the reasons I focus on people's backgrounds is because it helps define them, but you also do Moms on the Run, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, heavily involved as a mom. I have an eight-year-old uh, daughter, and Luke, my son, that's five, or just turned five. He makes a point that I don't call him for anymore. Um, so we do a lot of community events, like the Moms on the Run, which we can involve the family and the kids. Um, my kids come into the office quite often, so it's really nice for them to see uh, what this environment looks like and hopefully that they'll grow into the roles that my husband and I are in. And, uh, yeah, all around it's uh, busy, busy with freight as well. You know, freight's coming out of our ears right now, so uh, keeping keep busy. Yeah, I'm sure you are busy. So uh, speaking to that, Full Tilt Logistics, through this, this, this crisis, everybody has been uh, affected. I, I imagine that your business has been affected uh, by COVID as well. And, and can you talk of that a little bit about how it has affected your business over this past year? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're in a great spot right now, so I'll start off by saying that. But uh, prior to COVID hitting, uh, we were involved in a lot of um, expedited high-end show freight, and uh, that immediately ceased. And so I lost about 80% of my business on our brokerage side. Um, and then in addition, my light asset side, uh, you know, the rates were in the tank and we were wondering if we were going to be able to survive. Um, and it was just a really tough time because, you know, you're supposed to be motivated for your team and, and really come together. But as owners, when you work so hard for something and see it just completely getting demolished right in front of your eyes. It was almost like mourning a death. Um, but we came together. We have a lot of open management type of um, style here at Full Tilt. And so, you know, just getting together with our team and, and being open about where we were mentally and emotionally as owners um, and saying, you know, what can we do? How can we pivot? How can we uh, come out of this? And so we were fortunate that with our team, uh, we've been able to pull through. Rates are great. We've been in, uh, involved in some new industries that are, are different types of shipping for us, increased our volume, and now we're actually looking at um, bringing on a different entity or a different part of Full Tilt. I can't share too much of that right now. Uh, but just, you know, that transition from also managing the personal effects of, of this shutdown, but... Um, you know, I would just say stay positive and uh, really try to look at different verticals that you can get into. Where is your exposure in those verticals? What kind of freight are you moving over at, at full tilt? And has that evolved and changed at all throughout, throughout COVID as you have to react to the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, mainly we've always been OTR. Uh, we do do some rail and intermodal drayage, but uh, it's been mainly OTR. But we've really had to step more into the LTL sector, so we're doing a lot more volume, a lot more industry industry specific within consumer based goods such as you know packaging, 
items that uh, manufacturers have to use, paper goods, uh, cleaning products. So we really were able to go into those sectors. And then as far as verticals, uh, we're starting to look at some different variables within our warehousing, um, as well as some different services within the trucker world. Like I said, I can't divulge too much about that right now. I'd love to share, but we're really excited about what's on the horizon. Sounds like there's something exciting on the horizon, Dooner. I'm, I'm picking up a vibe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but Tiffany, it sounds like you guys, uh, like you're, you're full tilt into some diversification. And as you, you've mentioned a couple of times, you're excited about this new uh, uh, deal that is going down, whatever that's going to be. And we're excited for that for you. It's good to hear that you guys have come from how are we going to survive to now branching out and, and moving forward. Uh, so can you talk to that a little bit and how you navigate through COVID and what you guys did specifically? I know you brought up some, some things there, but moving forward, what are the lessons that you learned and how can you help survive a little bit better than you did at the very beginning of the COVID moving forward? And just to add to that, especially with employees too, just from your perspective yeah, yeah. As, as, as a leader at, at your company, you have a lot of responsibility there as well. I think the, the biggest thing to take from this is to not be complacent um, and too comfortable. You know, I think it's constant um, taking of, uh, you know, taking the initiative to looking, analyzing your business, what you're doing. And as far as like your portfolio, you know, we thought that we um, were really diversified, but evidently a lot of our transportation had to do with group gatherings even though it was in, you know, trade show and touring and, you know, audio visual, um, really kind of looking at, at what that portfolio looks like and making sure that you're diversified. And then in addition to that, it's, it's being open with your team. So as a leader, um, I think it's, it's really important that we're transparent with our team members. You know, we want to be great leaders and, and want to be motivating to them, but it, it's also important for them to see us when we're, we're not at our best and to say, you know, we really need to come together and we need you um, to help us, you know, let's work together. Let's brainstorm on, on different things that we can be doing um, as, as a team, as a group, as a company. So really validating their input um, and bringing them into what we're doing as a whole. Wow. So what does the outlook look like as we're going into this this peak season that, uh, you know, as, as that, that article we had on Freightways.com said, Amazon 75 day peak season because of the Prime Day and all that going on. So what does the outlook look like for you for Q4? I think it looks fantastic. On our asset side, we're going to be getting some amazing rates. Um, so our trucks are going to be busy on the roads and hopefully the weather doesn't hit us too hard on the, on the path that we have to go over on I-80. But in addition to that, um, on logistics, I think that there's going to be some difficulties in managing the spot market, you know, if a lot of the capacity is sucked up into um, certain markets. But uh, just focusing on the relationships that we have with our carriers uh, and taking care of them really well um, and just, you know, my team staying on top of things. Excellent stuff. And I think the mindset that you had talked about earlier with, you know, talking with your employees and talking with your managers and helping to get those ideas and navigating through this situation and moving forward and how you future proof those ideas from those frontline people and your managers are essential for business. Are they not? Exactly. I think it's, um, it's very important that you listen to them and really put a lot of what they have to say into um, into action. So. Completely agree. And, you know, bring it back to rugby. I bet all that team building, all that, <laughs> all that version of Haka that you were doing came, came, uh, came in handy when bringing employees back in the office, teaching them about, uh, about working together as a team and as a community and being smart and getting one another's back. If people want to learn more about you and the company, how do they go about doing that? Uh, you know, I think go to our website, fulltiltlogistics.com. Uh, pick up the phone, give me a call. I'm always down to chat. And, uh, of course, we have our uh, Facebook and Instagram page, so follow us there. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. Great guest. I wish I wish you showed us a little bit of the haka. Maybe we'll have to do our own. I need a little bit of training. We're going into a break. We come back a little bit more. What the truck? Now we're going to take a trip over to Nicole Glenn's house. She's, uh, she's the over at Candor Expedite. Excited yeah. to see what she has going on, how she's spending her day, because I know what she's doing with us right here at Last Mile Logistics. Nicole, what's up, girl? Hi, guys. How are you doing today? 
<laughs> doing, doing great, good. Nicole. Thanks. <laughs> How are things treating you over in uh, where are you, Plano, Texas? Yeah. So living the dream. It's still beautiful. I'm rocking summer, working outside almost every day lately. I'm I'm lucky. Now, our last guest had a lot of rugby experience, and she said she started doing that so she could tackle other girls. Do you have and any, drink beer. any uh, rugby experience or maybe, I don't know, uh, what do they call that in, in, uh, in high school? What's the, what's the all-girl football game, like the turkey game? The turkey game? I don't know. I mean, it's just Field a Boston hockey? thing. <laughs> Powder Powder puff puff. game. There we yeah. go. Powder yeah. puff game. Got any experience in that, Nicole? No, but I was telling uh, someone on another show once that my background was winning a pickleball championship in high school. What is Do you guys ball? know what pickleball is? No, oh. pickleball? So it's basically like a giant ping pong paddle. And then you have a wiffle ball. And you have a full tennis court and a teammate. And it's just back and forth, almost like giant ping pong tennis. Wow. That sounds kind of Champion. fun. I could get into that. Yeah. I could get that, that. You know, that sounds pretty champion. niche. She's doesn't champion. It? That sounds like a pretty niche game to play. And I know that today you wanted to talk about selecting true niche companies. How's that yeah. for a how's that for a tie in, Michael Vincent? <laughs> yeah. I don't know that fly you on there. your head. Blue shit. I know that fly. You That's why you he's... into it. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Let's let's kick it off. So even define that a little bit. What would be a niche company versus maybe a more traditional provider? Someone that's doing a selected service as their primary service, you know, something that they dive into and they have selected providers to work with, selected, selected procedures, you know, diving into that particular mode of transportation. I mean, I think with White Glove and Final Mile really coming to the forefront for a lot of companies, uh, we're seeing a lot of people interested in just adding it to their menu. Yeah, so there, there's people bringing that in. Why do you think that is particularly now? Is it, is it really the e-commerce that's making that happen in logistics? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You guys can see from really how easy it is to get something delivered to your door now. We're starting to become Madonnas, you know. I, like, I ordered a candle the other day, and it was broken, and I was ticked off because I'm oh. like, I could have just gone to the store. So the world is starting to move forward with this concept of having everything delivered to us easily, Right, right away. And that's that's also going into other spaces for retail. You know, now you can go pick up your goods there at the store. Um, it's, I mean, any any facet, if you're a doctor office now ordering a uh, table, you know, you want that in a certain amount of time and you want that to be there and delivered beautifully inside the location. So that's why I wanted to talk about the niche provider is just being able to step into that space and really offer that service. I mean, it's a huge learning curve for companies, you know, having that procedures and policies and experience behind it. It's just so important for this industry. Nicole, we are so much alike. I'm a massive diva too when my deliveries show up late or, yeah. or destroyed. Some people saw my saga on Twitter when my Lego box came broken. But, you know, you know, I, I got to answer to my kids. We all have bosses, right? And if things come destroyed or they come late, I got, I got a four-year-old and a six-year-old who are going to take me to court, you know? So I got to make sure they go there. So you got to make sure you're partnering with the right company. So how do you make sure you are partnering with the right company, especially when you're talking about niches, right? Because when you start doing that, you're getting less and less experiential information. I think it's being open to talking to the service provider and really having like an interview session with them. They get uh, bombarded, shippers or even people planning and logistics get bombarded with so many service su suppliers that claim that they can do all the different modes. And so it's really knowing those important questions on how a company operates and really what their background is, is so important. You know, how often are they dancing in this space? You know, how are they going about selecting their providers if they're a brokerage or working with their drivers if they're an asset-based company? What is that? What does that process and procedure look like from start to finish? Yeah, that's really interesting. But one of the things that, um, uh, Nicole, is, is the advancements in technology. And certain, certainly the, the technology and the automation in our industry has been moving forward. And it has for a number of years. But this, this uh, crisis has, has definitely sped up that cycle. Uh, and, and certainly changed us towards this delivery and you need it the next day in the e-commerce, which is going to be here to stay. It's not just a safety thing anymore. People are discovering that it's very, very uh, convenient to do. But this, this new technology,
technology and automation throughout it, uh, the proliferation of that across all of the different companies, does, does that uh, bring in the more broad players into those niche industries? Does it make them uh, a better player in those niche uh, markets or does it threaten the niche players in any way, do you think? No, I mean, when I, when I think of the examples of our company, I don't think it, it threatens it. There's, there's always going to be a very hands-on approach when you're talking about final mile white glove. I mean, it's inevitable for it to happen. So you're going to have to be able to uh, have technology, make it easy for the customer, make it easy for the consumer that's, that's purchasing it. But I think that's where it's a little different because technology can't just replace every single thing of it. You know, there's going to be a lot of handholding, confirmations, uh, really touching, touching a shipment from start to finish th through technology. Are you looking to, uh, th this is a two-part question, are you scared at all of some of the bigger players who are starting to infringe on this space? And are you looking to uh, acquire any companies or, or bring in some new technology to expand the scope of what you can do to, to enter into this emerging market further, deeper? Oh yeah, we're always looking into different technologies. Um, from even our bidding process all the way through our track trace piece. So yeah, that you have to evolve in this industry or you won't be around long enough. Uh, it doesn't scare me. It actually excites me because yeah. I think we need to evolve. I think uh, people who are threatened by the concept of change, they just won't be around long enough. You have to understand what's out there, what's coming, and then how, how can you be a pioneer in that? How can you adapt those things and change your company and, and run with it? I think learning from some of the other companies that are you know, buying into this technology, the AI side of things, I think it's exciting. So I think it's going to remold uh, our industry and and make it awesome, which is what what we need to do. Yeah, Michael, as she said, sometimes you just got to grin and bear it. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> that's it. I'll, I'm out. That's, that's my body double <laughs> when they're setting up this... Uh, this stage here, as you can see, we match. Hey, hey, Nicole, you were talking about, you know, being excited about the future, and you're talking about being able to, you know, embrace that change, and you're really excited looking forward. The future, open up your crystal ball, or don't open up your crystal ball, but what are you, what are you excited about in the future for advancements in technology or, or new trends in our industry? Oh, there's so many. Um, the concept of, of being able to have what we want on demand and understand where everything is from the beginning of an order all the way through it arriving to someone's door or a retail's uh, facility. I think that is a very exciting piece. Um, getting getting drivers to have tools that make it easier for them. You know, their their worlds are still very automated. Uh, I mean, not automated. They're very manual. They're still doing the call-in concept. And it's really getting the individuals to buy into the sense of technology, making their lives easier and more rewarding. So that way they can actually handle more and do more. And as we see it in this industry, no matter how much technology and great things have come, communication is still a huge issue. You know, it's regardless if you have all the technology in the world, if one system doesn't talk to another, you're gonna have issues with that. And it's working through that and, and making all of those pieces work from a driver's point of view, through supply chain leaders and, and creating that just beautiful platform. Can you imagine everything just being communicated at once, getting customer service involved, getting a shipping manager involved where they don't have to see everything. You know, We touch something and we have to constantly touch it. So again, as much as any company wants to come in and say, you know, it's seamless, it's this, there's always that human element that comes into play in transportation that we have to align with technology and people. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicole. That was, uh, that was Nicole Glenn from Candor Expedite. Amazing talking to her. We're going to go into a break, but on the other side of that, we have yet another amazing guest right here on What The Truck. We have another wonderful desk guest now. It's a desk. We have another wonderful we desk do. as well, but we have a great guest too. It is Kelly Picard. She's CEO of Hack Barth Delivery Service, and she's here with us right now. Kelly, how you doing out there? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Hey, did you know something? She is an LSU graduate. You know who else went to LSU? Um, 
Shaq. Not Sha Oh, Shaq. Well, you know who else went there? Bill Conti. And Bill Conti, he composed the score to my favorite movie, The Karate Kid. That's right, Daniel Sin. Crank to you in the head. Yeah. Absolutely. So I liked it. <laughs> LSU Tiger. I'm all, you're already on the good side with me. So how's it going today, Kelly? You look like you're, uh, you look like, are you on vacation or something over there? No, I wouldn't call it vacation. <laughs> that was lovely. I'm down in Orange Beach. I'm, 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 I'm operating remotely today from Orange Beach, Alabama. Well, perfect. Well, yeah. hey, give us a little background. What is, what's Hack Park Delivery Service for those who may not be initiated? Okay, so Hack Park is my family's business. We have been in the delivery and logistics space for 45 years. We're celebrating our 45th year coming up in November. And we've done a myriad of different things involved throughout the course of time. We started out as a bank courier logistics company, moved into small package distribution, um, which has really exploded for us. We do a lot of e-commerce now, um, in addition to a great deal of medical, um, pharmaceutical supplies, those things in, a, in, in white glove. I know you guys were talking about white glove earlier. We've really seen that explode, even despite COVID, um, surprisingly. So home deliveries have certainly taken off. Really, inside or through the fresh uh, through the threshold and set up and that type of stuff with the uh, you know the, your your premium white glove. Yeah, you know, so you, you kind of uh, hinted on this earlier, but white glove means a lot of different things to different people. So okay. it could be a, a big bulky delivery that's wrapped. Um, it could be um, uncrating, taking it to the room of choice, removing the debris and what have you. And, and for us, for some of our customers, we actually do the full installation of appliances. So you order a new dishwasher, we remove the old dishwasher, install the new dishwasher. Now that varies by market and of course by the codes under which you know we fall in, in each market that we're doing those types of deliveries. So white glove does mean a lot of different things and there's a lot of different levels uh, to white glove. Now I can't but help, help but notice you're over there in the lovely state of, what, Alabama, right? Yes. So disasters, right? Disaster preparedness. You know, you've had a tornado or two sweep through there. There's been floods, those kind of things. Hurricane, you know, it's Hurricane Delta, right? Tropical Storm Delta. Hurricane right. Hurricane. It's a hurricane. It's a hurricane now. Oh, yeah. So that came on. There's been a, and it's on Delta because there's been so many storms. We had to go back to the top of the alphabet. So what role does Final Mile play in disaster preparedness? So for our medical I, I call our medical verge, or vertical rather the most the most critical. Uh, those are supplies that people depend on, um, not just for quality of life, but to sometimes in some cases continue their life. Uh, and I could go back to Hurricane Katrina. So one of our larger terminals is in New Orleans, Louisiana. And as you guys may remember, um, that was a pretty big storm, and it it you know the damage stretched from Louisiana all the way throughout Alabama. I mean. Uh, it was it was pretty devastating, and for us, we had to get in there to service the hospitals, bring them the needed supplies. There were hospitals over there that had no power, and I can remember one day, um, our manager took a straight truck in, got to the hospital, who had been without power for probably three or four days at the point. The workers to receive the freight were standing on the dock, and they were literally literally crying when the truck arrived because they had patients dying. Um, that you know, they didn't have supplies. So that, that's probably one of the most extreme cases, but, you know, we've been dealing with hurricanes in Florida and Alabama and Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas for, for the last 45 years. So we've gotten really good at it. We have a disaster response trailer that we send to affected areas to help keep things going. And, you know, the final mile carriers are really, they, they keep the wheels of commerce turning, whether it's delivering food supplies, whether it's delivering medical supplies and equipment, um, company, there are companies like Hackworth all over the country that do the same thing that we do. That's a, yeah, that's a great example of just how important uh, logistics and the supply chain is to, to all of us. And, and certainly the final mile to your, to your point, talking about that's an extreme case. It, it is an extreme case, but it's not all that uncommon. And so can we talk a little bit about what's coming forward with, uh, um, you know, the impacts of, of, of COVID? Uh, certainly the crisis has affected your business, but can we talk about uh, the forthcoming vaccine and the distribution there and where your role falls in that being a uh, regional last mile? So depending on um, 
depending on how the vaccine gets distributed, uh, whether it's through you know regional carriers, national carriers, um, a dedicated distribution network, there are a lot of options, a lot of ways to get it distributed. But to me, what makes the most sense is probably to go through the wholesalers, because the wholesalers supply all of the hospitals, the clinics, the pharmacies with all uh, any manner of product. So um, to me, that's probably what makes the most sense. We do quite a bit of work for the three main wholesalers in the U.S. They are our largest customers. So during COVID, when it hit, we had been prepping for that. Uh, starting at the end of January and end of February, we were having meetings with all of our operations teams. So we have we have 40 locations across 11 states. And we do, I don't know, it's over 100,000 packages a day that we're delivering on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. We also do Saturday delivery. You know, in that time frame, we didn't miss one delivery due to COVID. All of our drivers showed up. I mean, I, I think that the story here is what is essential? And, and I think we figured out through COVID who are the essential workers. And anybody, you know, in transportation logistics, if you're a contractor and you have a truck and a vehicle and you, you have some qualification, you're working right now. Yeah, a little bell for the essentials, a little cowbell for all of them. Hey, I have a question for you, Kelly. So on the White House lawn yesterday, President Trump, he tweeted out a video of himself talking about the vaccine. And my ears perked up when he said the word logistics. And he said that the vaccine would be distributed by the military, seeming to imply, he said it's easy stuff going to be delivered by the military, seeming to imply it won't be done by private sector distributors. Uh, what was, do you think that that's the case or was that just kind of um, a statement? I don't want to speculate on what the president might be um, saying or doing or coordinating the effort. I, I know there's a heightened awareness. I mean, I, personally, for me, I, for one, I'm not the first in line to take the vaccine. That's just yeah. me, though. <laughs> I'm going to wait and see what happens. <laughs> um, as far as the military distributing it, I mean, that, that could make sense. I mean, we have all these resources in our military. They're in every state already. Um, that's another way to go. I mean, we have a National Guard presence in every, you know, every state and community, you know, maybe decent sized city across the country. So that's just another way to go. I would say that, the, and frankly, that if we're already, if we're already bearing some costs for those folks anyway, it could cut some costs out of the supply chain in some respects because the wholesaler is going to need to make something. I mean, you know, the manufacturer is going to need some margin. I don't know what the margin is on it. I don't know what it costs to develop, but, um, and then they would have to pay us to make the delivery and we pay the driver. And so going through the military, is it, a, is it a better cost play? I can't answer that question because I don't know what the cost basis is for that. But what I can say is the wholesalers are equipped, it's set up, and they've got the network of carriers to get it distributed and get it distributed very quickly throughout the country. We're delivering five to six days a week to every hospital. Like I said, we do 10 states for three of the whole, 10 to 11 states for three of the wholesalers, different markets. There are other regional carriers like us that are doing the exact same thing in other parts of the country. You know, that's fascinating stuff. She, she brings up cost, too. And in that same about five minute statement out of Trump, he did say it would be free. Once it's available to all Americans, it would be free. And part of that cost structure falls into this final mod delivery, along with the cold chain. Uh, I think the military may face some challenges having to do it. The people in our space are very experienced, do this all the time. But we'll have to see how that all pans out. Kelly, you've given us some great information today. You've shared a lot with us. How do people reach out and learn more about uh, Hackbart Delivery Services? So a couple of things, you can visit our website at www.hackbarthdelivery.com. There's a lot of information there. And I'd also like to do a little plug for a trade association. I'm on the board of a group called the Customized Logistics and Delivery Association. And that is, um, it's founded in 1987. And like the name implies, its membership is largely made up of final mile carriers like ourselves that do warehousing logistics. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have to go into a break, but thank okay. you so much for your time today. We'll be back. Thank you. We're back here at the live desk, and now we have a really amazing guest. It's William Sacchetti. He's the founder and CEO of Cargo. And when you guys see this car that they developed, it's absolutely wild. It's an autonomous uh, delivery vehicle that also gives you your packages. 
Amazing stuff, man. We are really living in the future. I, I, I want the. I, I don't care about the. I want this car just so I can commute in it. It's cool. <laughs> we just see the whole premise. Yeah, I know, but it's just oh, a cool man. looking William, car. William, are you here? Can you set this gentleman straight? Firstly, <laughs> <laughs> hello. Greetings from London, rainy London. Yeah, um, it is the coolest car. Um, I'm actually, I've actually got a personal one I'm working on, so I too would be whizzing around in one of these. Uh, see, William, see, I, I'm jealous. He set you straight. Maybe it has a dance floor <laughs> big enough to do TikToks like that Amazon TikTok studio <laughs> by Ruby on that, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, <laughs> I got to say, too, now I'm not the most stylish guy on uh, Freight Waves TV now that we have William here. No, see his outfit? He is dapper. Yeah. You define the word dapper, my man. Uh, that, this is something I just threw on. It's casual. It's, it's, you know, it's evening here. Yeah. So. Look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's just playing it down. Yeah, wearing that, looking you know, decked out like that, driving around in that in that vehicle around London. Get out of here, man. Well, let's talk about it. So, what is, so let's start maybe at the, at the source. What is the Academy of Robotics? Because that is where this vehicle is developed. So maybe if we define oh. that, we'll learn a little bit more about this vehicle. Yeah, sure. So Academy of Robotics is a company which I founded, which makes cargo. So cargo is an autonomous delivery vehicle. We try and make it so if you buy something online, we can get it to you preferably in less than 30 minutes at a cost of pennies because the car is electric. There's nobody inside. It is literally a delivery bot. It's about the size of a normal small car like a Ford Focus or Fiesta if you have those in the States. So a normal Ford size car and it whizzes around doing delivery runs by itself automatically. Wow, that, that's wild. I love the design of it. So let, let's talk about the design of that, uh, that car. Can you talk about that? We see the side coming yeah, off absolutely. and the B-roll, that type of stuff. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So what we did is um, um, I always wanted to work in the logistics space, and I first believed we could automate delivery using drones. But then I realized the path of least resistance was going to be on the road. And the implementations we were seeing were these big, ugly boxes. And I thought, do you know what? This should be something that kids get as excited as they do when the ice cream man comes, or when the ice cream van comes. So when we designed it, we're going for what I thought, what I'd like to call the ice cream van effect. What would, what could we create that is so amazing to look at? Because we live in the 21st century and life's short, so why not? And that's what led to that very futuristic spaceship-like design because it kind of works like a sci-fi film and it looks really cool. Well, that's the thing, too. I mean, you can, you can stand out by looking cool, but stand out by being too big will we'll really stand out in London. I don't know if you've been there recently, Michael Vincent, but big cars, not really a big yeah, thing fit. in don't downtown fit. London. Yeah. yeah, they don't fit so well. Exactly. exactly. So what happens is, that, so this car is much smaller than a van, about maybe 75% the size of a Prius. So it's even smaller than a Toyota Prius, quite a small car. The reason is, if you look at the stats, most of the diesel vans in cities like London, they leave and they run at 20, 30% capacity anyway. The reason this happens is because there's pressure to deliver next day, next day. So most of these vans are empty. So as you know, our roads are designed more for horses and carts than they are um, for big white cars like yours are. So we made the car very nimble, very small. I think it actually classes more like a heavy quadricycle than a car. It's very, it's very cool. You want to get kids excited here? Make it into the hot dog mobile. Yeah. You know, like the Oscar <laughs> hot dog mobile. I, I feel right. personally attacked for my Cybertruck when you said big wide <laughs> cars like yours. I don't have the Cybertruck yet, but it's <laughs> no, pretty no, big and wide. Offset, I do have that electric Vespa though. The one yeah. I'm telling you. And you gotta like shout at people when you're driving because it's so quiet. Which is actually my question about your delivery vehicle. Uh, is there any danger in accidents? Because I know when I'm on, on my electric Vespa, it makes no noise whatsoever. So sometimes someone's getting too close. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm just gonna yeah. yell at them. <laughs> I suppose um, one thing to know about the technology is um, with tech like this or self-driving car technology, it's not tech we kind of just invented out of nowhere. Tech seems to go one stage, one stage. It's like stage of the evolution. So if you go back to early 2000s, you saw the advent of cruise control. And then as time went on, this cruise control got cruise control. The lane assist now it keeps you lane. And then the more modern cars, they automatically break for you. All we've done is we've done the next stage in the evolution of the car. We haven't gone from like a rotary phone to a smartphone. There's stages in between. And that's kind of what we've done. This is why they're relatively safe, as in the tech has been around for years, but it's just maybe the way we're using it or the way we've adapted to now make the algorithm make it drive itself. It's just the next stage in the evolution of cars. It's awesome. So, uh, all right, we're, we're, we're talking about it we're cruising around the streets of, of London. When am I going to see this in Chattanooga, Tennessee? 
So, um, firstly, we actually passed a really big milestone here in the UK. Uh, last week, we got something called minister's approval, which means this is now a street legal vehicle that can be on the road with other cars. And that's quite a significant milestone because in Europe, there are no autonomous cars, or pretty much probably the first in Europe would be Google, Tesla. In the States, um, we're a relatively small company. We could put the cars in the States now. It's just if we find someone to fund us, you'll have them there sooner than you could, you could realize. Now, I have a quote from uh, Martin Newman. He's founder at Customer First Group. He says, I invested in cargo for a couple reasons. It will very much put the customer in control of when and where they receive their delivery. And you might think of it as cut consumer empowerment. Now, this seems cool to me. So if I wanted to invest in cargo, you come out with a SPAC. Those are pretty popular down here. Baby got SPAC in the United States. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So funny stories. Um, we actually are funded by individuals mainly. No corporations. We've done this all by ourselves. And I've got about maybe 400 investors who are all individuals who over time joined us. And Martin Newman's very right. He's a sort of, he's quite a well-known consumer expert here in the UK. And he's seen the trend of what's happening with consumer behaviors. And it is definitely going towards people want the ease of an Uber, the ease of you press a button and it turns up. And using modern technology, we've been able to apply that to logistics. Very interesting. So um, you, you've got a unique design there. You've got you've got approval for this to be a street legal uh, there there in the UK, and and yeah. hopefully bringing this to the United States. I can't wait to see this thing. But talk to its capabilities a little bit and why you see this this particular vehicle, the direction you guys are going, as being the game changer in autonomous vehicles. Yeah, for sure. So what we've done is that we thought about consumer habits. And if you think of, a, I gave an example earlier, a modern taxi app, be it Uber or anybody, for the consumer, when you buy your package, it's as similar to an Uber app. You can actually see, there's my car, it's driving towards me. So these are habits we're already used to, things we've been doing for a while. The only difference is you just go outside to pick up your package. And those in logistics will tell you, or last mile logistics will tell you, the worst nightmare ever is not knowing that the vehicle has been there. Because the biggest cost tends to be that re-delivery or misdelivery. Because that misdelivery cost is the worst thing ever. So we're solving that problem by simply, I'd say, going one step ahead of what's, what's currently already, what people are already doing. So inside the vehicle is a very clever package management system where, so we might have up to 24 packages at any one time. And as the vehicle is driving towards you, um, if it decides to change its destination, a revolving mechanism changes. So when it gets to your house, you only see your package. So it comes out, a little hatch opens, and there's your package. When the next person, when it goes to the next person's house, they see their package and so on and so on. So it's a sort of moving logistics hub, which is able to deliver in any particular order, preferably less than 30 minutes. Well, I just want to pop that Kinder Egg open and take all the toys out of the middle of it. Uh, I gotta tell you, when you put these things on the road, right, you have to do a lot of training. You have to, you have to deal with a lot of different real-world, non-real-world circumstances. You can't do it all in simulation. So how do you get these roadworthy and how do you get over that hurdle because i know in america like uber for example was really trying yeah. to get their autonomous taxi out yeah. a jogger uh, at night runs across the road ends up getting hit it's one person out of a lot of testing but one person is too many in the margin of error we put on autonomous vehicles i don't know if regulations are as stringent in uk maybe they're worse maybe they're better but how do you get it roadworthy and safe Oh, yes, they are just as stringent, if not more stringent here in the UK, the regulations, that is. So what we've done, which is really interesting, is the thing about logistics is it's the same route over and over. So it's, it's not like a person driving from, let's say, um, New York all the way down to Austin, where you are. It's, it's, it's the same route over and over, a small five to ten mile radius in the UK at least. So all we have to do is train for that local area. So we don't need a billion dollars to train to drive everyone on Earth. It's just that local area. And then another place we excel is most of our team, we went to a university which is known for building the vision system for the Mars rover. So driving on unmarked roads is our expertise. So we built algorithms that allow us to drive in residential areas with a very little training data using a type of memory we invented. For example, if you go to your local train station and you want to drive home, um, you know exactly where home is, you don't need your <clears throat> Um Similar concepts that we 
first have these cars drive the area and then they have a sort of memory and then all they do now they drive using memory just like you do because we focus a lot of what we do based sim very similar to how humans navigate themselves you know, we talk about we talk about safety, and but the, the other aspect of safety and security is cyber security. So Michael Vincent might try to physically commandeer one of these things by jumping <laughs> on top and trying to skateboard on it or something like that. Florida man. But but when you when you when you do talk about tech like this, one of the concerns is that's you know a, a nefarious actor, a hacker could go in and hack the vehicle and use it as as a weapon or just to steal someone's goods, whatever it may be. How do you counteract that? So, so I think there's, um, there's a big separation between the security industry and the autonomous car space. What I mean by this is um, we don't focus too much on securing the car, but what we do is we hire security experts to do so. So much like a bank manages your money, but they get security companies that encrypt all the information, all that, and that's all we've done. We're experts at getting cars to drive autonomously, and then we get the best penetration testers we can, who've proved with banks, with money, that money can be safe in a bank. And that, that, that's, yeah, and that's, that's the solution, I suppose, as in the right person, the right job. For us, we make our spaceship cars. We make them move and make them work um, with no errors. And we get the best person in the security space to then jump in. And if you were worried about your package, um, you'd have better luck breaking into an ATM because it's a moving safe. It's, it's a moving safe with 4K cameras in all possible directions. So it's not a very smart thing to try and break, it, break into a logistics autonomous car. Hey, William, you know, with this thing, with, the, with, you, with your vehicle's size, its nimbleness, it, you know, you're we're operating in the, in the inner city, and like you said, these kind of confined type of areas, right? Yeah. Do you see this moving as like a, a, a crosstown courier at some point where I can just order one up to show up my offices, throw a package in there and send it across town? Absolutely, that's the direction it is going. So at the moment, we already, I think a lot of people are using Ubers for that at the moment where they'll get an Uber to turn up and they'll send a package across. And I foresee a future where there is a sort of um, what would, if we go maybe five years in the future, where petrol stations or fuel stations, you call them, won't be as popular because people have electric cars. So these places like fuel stations will probably be hubs where autonomous cars like this are just stationed, waiting to be summoned to go on a specific task. And yes, absolutely, you likely will soon be pressing a button, turn up at your house, you put in your package and off you go. And it'll cost cents. See, that's all Michael needed to know. He's an investor now in K-A-R-G-O. That's Cargo. <sighs> William, thank you so it. much for thank you so much for joining us on the show. We, we really dug this and thanks for sharing that really cool car with us, man. Thank you so much. That was, that was that was an awesome time. By the way, for those of you out there, this is the first time you've ever seen What the Truck. I don't know what you're doing with your life. Because <laughs> what the Truck is on every Monday and Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time right. on Freightways TV, Freightways LinkedIn, Freightways Facebook. Maybe it'll be on live.freightways.com and get this chat rolling along with the, with the What the Truck shows. I'm digging what people are talking about. You know what they want to see? What they they want to see you and me on that Vespa riding around Chattanooga. Maybe we can shoot a new What the Truck intro. We can Maybe do that. Yelling at people. I'll bring, my goal, like, I'll bring my GoPro. Oh, yeah, bring a bow and arrow. Oh, oh, we yeah. get multiple shots. Oh, take shots. Of the, yeah, <laughs> we'll shoot down some drones together. We're talking yeah, we'll about go it at the beginning drones. of the episode. Go do some drone hunting. You, you can find this show on podcast players everywhere. Look up What the Truck or look up Freightcast to get every single Freightways podcast. You know what it is? It's the largest network in freight. That's what it is. Go right. to live.freightways.com. Register. You're going to win a Peloton. That's going to be awesome. You get, and get in shape. Get ahead of that holiday weight. You can ride with me and Cody Rigsby. Turn up that resistance. Turn up that cadence. Keep it going. Boom, boom. That's what you need to be doing. <laughs> That's the exactly Freightways what TV you app. need to That's be doing. That's what you want to do, too. Keep the conversation going. We got way more show for you, so don't leave us here at Last Mile Logistics. Thank you for joining us on virtual event. Take it easy, everybody. Follow me on the Twitter at Timothy Dude. That's D-double-O-N-E-R. Follow him at Vincent the Dude. Peace and love. Peace and love.